it helps to think about glycolysis in the light of redox reactions because we can separate it out into a series of kind of three important processes that are related to redox chemistry. The first is the oxidation of glucose to two molecules of pyruvate and four electrons, and you see that here. To balance out the charges, four H pluses are also generated in this process. I just ran out of room on the end of the slide here. This is a thermodynamically favorable process. If you look at the delta G for the process under standard conditions, it's negative 279 kilojoules per mole, very exothermic or exergonic. And if you think about this as a redox half reaction, more specifically an oxidation half reaction, the oxidation potential, which we label as E, is 724 millivolts. Just to remind you, this is, for example, the potential that would be generated if we set up a galvanic cell with glucose and pyruvate on one side and the standard hydrogen electrode on the other side, we would expect a voltage of 724 millivolts. Again, quite favorable. This is a quite favorable oxidation process. The second process to consider, the second kind of sub-process of glycolysis, is the reduction of NAD plus to NADH. So NAD plus, two equivalents, react with two H pluses and four electrons to give two equivalents of NADH. This reaction is thermodynamically disfavored, and we've actually already seen the reason why. The fundamental organic chemistry reason why this reaction is disfavored is that it destroys aromaticity. We go from an aromatic pyridinium ion on the left to a non-aromatic product, and this is quite disfavored. For the two molecules of NAD+, the reduction potential now is negative 332 millivolts, and that corresponds to a delta G, a free energy change under standard conditions of about 128 kilojoules per mole. So this is a disfavored process, but NADH is a great reducing agent, and so it's advantageous from an energetic perspective for a biochemical system to generate this molecule so that it can reduce other molecules. Finally, the third process to consider is the union of a phosphate group and ADP to form ATP and water. And from our prior discussions of bioorganic phosphorus chemistry, it should be pretty clear that this is a disfavored process. In fact, the reaction wants to go the other way. The hydrolysis of ATP to form ADP and phosphate is heavily thermodynamically favored, specifically for two molecules of phosphate joining with two molecules of ADP, the total free energy change is about positive 88 kilojoules per mole. So that's a disfavored process. One of the reasons glycolysis works the way it does is that nature has figured out how to couple or link this favorable process, the oxidation of glucose to two molecules of pyruvate, to two disfavorable processes, the reduction of NAD plus to NADH and the union of ADP with phosphate or phosphorylation of ADP to form ATP. Through the reactions of glycolysis, these three processes become linked and the favorability, the thermodynamic favorability of the oxidation of glucose is really what's driving it all. This is the reason why glucose is such an important biochemical fuel. Let's take a look now at the individual steps of glycolysis from a bird's eye view. There are two general stages involved in glycolysis, and each stage has a well-defined metabolic purpose. On the whole, the way the steps of glycolysis are organized ensures biochemical efficiency, and we'll see what that means here in a second. In stage one, the six carbon glucose is broken down into two three carbon units, and this stage requires an investment of two molecules of ATP in order to do this. Because there's an ATP investment that happens here, there's actually an energetic investment that occurs in the first stage of glycolysis. It's sometimes called the investment phase. And this raises a really interesting question of why this exists. After all, why is nature investing energy into glycolysis? That's like putting money in the bank when your goal is to take money out of the bank. Well, there are a few different reasons why we might want to reduce a six carbon compound to a three carbon compound. This product, by the way, is known as glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, or what I'll abbreviate as G3P. One of the reasons that this breakdown takes place is that it provides a three carbon building block. Keep in mind that metabolism is an interconnected set of reactions. G3P is not just generated in glycolysis, and it can be siphoned off to other biochemical pathways if needed. For example, it can be used to construct longer chains of carbons with different structures 
than glucose, that wouldn't be possible or would be much more difficult if we tried to directly manipulate glucose in some cases to get other complex structures. Another reason nature might want to break a six carbon compound down into a three carbon compound has to do with what we might call convergence. From a synthetic perspective, convergence has an advantage. It lowers the total number of steps to break a compound down. For example, instead of unique enzymes and unique reactions associated with each one of these bonds, these carbon-carbon bonds in the chain of glucose, the total number of enzymes that have to be involved is actually much smaller. Since once we've broken the six carbon glucose into two equivalent three carbon molecules, the same set of enzymes can operate on both halves. In essence, we take the top half of glucose and the bottom half of glucose and we funnel both of those into a single common metabolic intermediate, G3P, which is then processed by a common set of enzymes to get us to the final products, which are ultimately pyruvate and ATP and NADH. That convergence is a huge evolutionary advantage. It simplifies the nature of the biochemical pathway over one that involves chewing up glucose, say, in a linear way. It's much more efficient to break in the middle and process each half equivalently than to start breaking on one end and have a unique enzyme as we decompose glucose, say, from right to left. In stage two of glycolysis, we get production of ATP and NADH. And this, because we're getting these energy-rich molecules, ATP and NADH, is often called the payoff phase. The payoff of ATP is more than we invested in the investment phase. So after the completion of stage two, the overall process is energy storing. There's energy stored in newly generated ATP molecules. There's also energy stored in these NADH molecules we generate. And that energy storage is really the key. And it's really not just about energy storage, but also about energy transfer, because those ATP and NADH molecules don't hang around for long. They're used to power other metabolic processes. Because these molecules are extremely common cofactors, or coenzymes though, biochemical systems have very exquisite control over how they're used. So we start with a very general fuel in glucose, and in stage two, the production of ATP and NADH generates highly controlled and very easy to manipulate fuels within a biochemical system. So just to summarize, in stage one, we have the investment phase where glucose is broken up into two three carbon fragments, each of which is processed identically, which is convergent, highly efficient from a synthetic point of view. And in stage two, we get the energetic outputs of glycolysis with the production of these energy rich molecules that show up in a variety of different metabolic reactions in the active sites of many different enzymes to power biochemical processes. Finally, this figure just summarizes all of the reactions and intermediates of glycolysis in a single figure, and I'll just draw your attention here to the two stages and draw kind of a dividing line between the two stages. Stage one is everything on the top half of this graph, culminating in the synthesis of what I've called G3P, or GADP, glyceraldehyde phosphate. Glucose is first phosphorylated. That has an important purpose that we'll discuss in more detail here in a second. Then it's isomerized to fructose. Again, there's a deep logic to this that we will see a little bit later. Finally, it's phosphorylated again, and then a retroaldol reaction creates these two intermediates, GADP and DHAP, dihydroxyacetone phosphate. And interestingly, there's an enzyme that isomerizes dihydroxyacetone phosphate to form GADP, and so we've converted both halves, both three carbon halves of glucose, into a common metabolic intermediate. There's convergence showing up in this pathway. And from there, GADP is processed by a common set of enzymes to first form 1,3-phosphoglycerate. This generates a molecule of ATP right here in step seven, and then some additional processing is used to set up a molecule PEP, which can generate a second molecule of ATP in the final step of glycolysis, which leads to pyruvate as the overall product. So we can see investments of ATP happening in these phosphorylation events here and here. But then the payoff comes in the second half, which remember happens twice for every molecule of glucose. That's why you see two arrows here. And so we get two molecules of ATP out of step seven and two molecules of ATP out of step 10 for a net generation of two molecules of ATP overall.